it didn't occur to me, somebody came to me, Simon Chin, the producer, came to me, who I knew from the kind of documentary world, and Simon obviously produced Man on Wire and Searching for Sugarman, and uh, he came and said, I want to make a film about Whitney Houston, I'm in touch with this American producer who's been wanting to do it for a long time, and that was someone called Lisa Erspammer, um, who's based in LA. And I said initially, I'm not really interested in Whitney Houston. Well, I'm not sure there's anything interesting to say about Whitney Houston. And then I met with um, Nicole David, who's kind of co-producer on the film, who was Whitney's longtime film agent um, at William Morris. And she was the person who really intrigued me so much and made me think, oh, maybe there is a really interesting film, um, which is a kind of a mystery story, I suppose. Because what Nicole said to me was, I knew her probably as well as anybody for 25 years. I was her agent. I helped her in her Dan times. I was there celebrating the great times, but I never really understood her, and I never understood what hap why what happened to her happened to her, why she ended up in this tragic, this tragic death. And um, that intrigued me. I thought, how, how can somebody who, who, on the surface, you would think knew her so well, still be think that there's a mystery there? So that was kind of the origins of the movie for me. It is a kind of detective story, and so I deliberately left you know, my questions in the sense that I'm looking for something, trying to understand, and maybe a little bit puzzled by some of it, because they're also quite an extraordinary bunch of characters that you meet along the way, and her family, and her friends, her musicians. Um, it's, you feel like you're stepping into quite a dysfunctional and odd, sometimes surreal world. I wouldn't say everyone was open, no, in fact, I've never interviewed as many people for a film as I have on this. Um, I think I interviewed about 70 people, and I would say a good 20 or so of them uh, didn't make it into the cut, more, more, 30 of them probably didn't make it into the cut, which is a lot higher percentage than we normally think. But a lot of people just gave me the flannel. You know, they just gave me uh, the same old sort of, oh, she was wonderful, she was troubled, she was well, the, the voice of a generation, you know, kind of stuff, which surprised me because I think, you know, she died five years ago now, six years ago. And um, I feel like, you know, now is the time that there's a dis enough distance for you to be honest and to, to look at your, yourself as well as at her. And I think that is the key to why people find it hard to talk about her honestly, is that so many people around her feel guilty and they're not prepared yet in their own lives to kind of acknowledge that or admit that. But that's the feeling that comes off them, that there's a, that there's a lot of guilt. Um, so I would say I, there was a lot of lies, a lot of lies, and that just, of course, makes you more intrigued when you get people contradicting each other. You think, why, 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 why are they, what are they hiding? What's, what's going on? And um, I don't think in the end, you know, you can't, how can you understand anybody fully? But I felt by the end of the, ex of the kind of um, investigation, if I can call it that, I did sort of feel like um, we'd uncovered a couple of key things that unlocked a really important elements of her and make you sympathize with her a bit more, which I, I guess was the aim, you know, to feel like I understand her, understand this extraordinary behavior, understand the self-destruction, understand what she did to her daughter, um, because I understand these two or three things, which are to do with her family and her childhood. Well, Sissy, you can't help but feel tremendous compassion towards Sissy when you meet her. She seems like a woman in real pain you know she's 85 now I think and she um, is quite frail um, and she's lost her daughter and her granddaughter in the space of two years and had to see their lives play out tragically in public in the press so she agreed to be part of the film um, I did an interview with her which matched all the other interviews I did and she just wasn't really the, all there, I would, I would say. Um, her memory seemed to be poor. She really obviously was uncomfortable, didn't really want to talk about it, but felt she ought to. So the interview was not very successful. And then I took her down to the church, which is the church where the New Hope Baptist Church, which is where Whitney had been in the choir, where, where Sissy was the choir mistress. And I was just wanting her to do a couple of, you know, walking through kind of things, sitting there, just some visual elements. And then she started talking, and she suddenly became much more focused and, and, and coherent, I guess, because I think being in that place brought everything into sharp focus for her. 
And so they used those little bits of her in the church as you know, her, her presence in, in the film. And I kind of always felt like she, you know, what else do you need her to say, really? She's a woman who's a mother who's in pain, who, you know, you don't really want to prod because you feel like, you know, you've been through enough. And that, that, was, that was sort of how I felt. I, I, I interviewed each of the brothers at least three times. I think one three times and one four times. So it took quite a long time to gain their trust. And they're very troubled individuals themselves. They're, they're both quite guilty. They both have had really terrible addiction problems. Um, and, you know, I think that's sort of evident in the way that they are. You feel, again, from them, this sort of sense of sense of pain. Um, and they slowly began to trust me. And I think by the third interview, one of them, Michael, said to me, oh, you know, maybe we should do this every month. I'm finding it like therapy, you know. It's kind of interesting exploring my past and talking about her. So I think they were open. How open everyone was in the end, I don't know. I mean, you can only, you could keep going. I did feel like on this film, you could keep going for like five years, interviewing and re-interviewing and going deeper and deeper and deeper, which, um, uh, it's a strange, it's a strange feeling actually. I think when I when I first began to suspect that there might be some kind of abuse involved, it was actually before anyone had told me. I, I just I had a sense, having sat watching interviews about her, watching footage of her, um, I had a feeling that there was something, there's something wrong with her. There's something that is preventing her in some way from from expressing her real self. She felt uncomfortable in her own skin in almost every interview that there was with her. And I thought that's a very strange thing. And it, it kind of reminded me of people I'd seen who had suffered from abuse. And just in their kind of body language and the kind of the sense of holding something back. But that was just an intuition. And then somebody mentioned it uh, off camera to me, wouldn't talk about it on camera, and say that Whitney had said to her that something had happened. Um, and for a long time, that's sort of where it lay. I didn't know whether that was true. I didn't know it was and then I interviewed uh, Pat Houston and Gary Houston, who was Whitney's brother, and he told me that um, he was abused by a woman in the family. And Pat Houston told me that, yes, Whitney had said to her, this is what happened. Um, and so at that stage, I kind of had, you know, I had the confirmation that something had happened. I didn't know who it was. And then on the next interview, Gary did tell me who, who it was. And at that stage, I went to, this was the very end of filming, two weeks before we locked the cut, I, I persuaded um, Mary Jones, who was Whitney's longtime assistant in the sort of last 10 years of her life, um, and who knew her probably better in that period than, than any, anybody else. She was at her house every day. She was a very sympathetic person. And she told me, you know, Whitney's point of view on this and, you know, what Whitney had told her in detail and how important she felt it was for understanding Whitney, but how scared she, you know, everyone was to talk about it. And um, uh, so, yeah, the film changed radically in the last weeks of, of editing it. Um, which I guess is the result, as a detective, it's the result you want. Um, but obviously it's such disturbing allegations and we did have a lot of debate about whether or not, you know, how, how, how do you present material like this? You know, um, how do you do it in a way that's gonna be fair to the family and to somebody who's accused who's deceased? And I think in the end we felt that um, we had three different people saying this. One of them, Gary, was also abused by her. So we felt that having direct testimony of somebody saying this happened to me meant that even if by some incredible stretch of the imagination Whitney had been lying to everybody else about it, that there was no reason not to go public about it. And um, so, so we did, and I think also that in the environment now, today, everyone who I, all the sort of experts I spoke to about this, this area and this issue told me that you know, it's best to talk about these things and best for them to be out. And that is the kind of current thinking. It, 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 it may prevent other people being abused in the future. It may it give people the courage to come forward and say, this happened to me and this was the person who did it. So I, feel, I felt like there was, I was some nervousness about it to begin with because I didn't expect you're making a film about it, 
about somebody you know, who's an entertainer to lead to such a dark place. But um, once we got there, I felt like, no, this is, the, we, we, have, we have an obligation in a way to, to use this. So it's a very rambly answer. But, well, I think Bobby just isn't really, a, isn't ready to be honest in some way. And again, there's, there, there's, there's the perfect example of somebody who is, I think, just very guilty. And obviously that's, I'm surmising that, I don't know that, but it feels like there's a lot of guilt and a, and a, and a kind of posturing and a self-protectiveness that's still going on there. And he felt to me quite, um, yeah, just unwilling or unable to, to, to really be honest about himself and let alone to be honest about Whitney. But I felt like, although as it often happens in these kind of documentaries, the person doesn't necessarily need to say things that are that revealing in order to be revealing. I think seeing him and the kind of squirming answers that he gives to things in itself tells you, you know, oceans. One of the strange things about Whitney is that she didn't write a memoir. She didn't write songs that express, she's not like Amy Winehouse, you know, who wrote songs that are totally autobiographical and you're kind of parsing for information about her life. She didn't do that. She didn't write her own songs for the most part. She didn't give revealing interviews for the most part. Um, so she is this kind of closed box. And a lot of what you, you, when you start to try and understand her, you realize you can't understand her without understanding the times, where she's from. And it did almost feel to me like, you know, this was a, a short story that had, you know, three page short story that had five pages of footnotes. In a way, in order to understand her and quite simple life, you needed to understand the context. You need to understand you know, where her family came from. You need to understand the, 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 the ramifications of being uh, a black entertainer at that period in time. Um, you need to understand so much about attitudes to homosexuality. You need to be able to understand all sorts of things. And so the simplest way of putting all that background in without sort of swamping people with a five-hour film was to use kind of montage and suggestive little clips of the period. Um, so that's really what that's trying to do. It's trying to sort of fill in this sort of hugely important um, uh, background information. Yeah, the one person I think who is obvious in the film that is absent, you know, uh, 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 very obviously absent is Robin Crawford, who was Whitney's longtime sort of best friend and, um, uh, and assistant and who had famously an, an affair with her for some time in, in, when, they were, when they were young. Um, and she uh, talked about maybe doing the interview backwards and forwards for several months, and in the end she decided she didn't, she didn't want to do that, which was a shame. But um, and to begin with, I thought that was a sort of devastating blow because I thought we would get her to talk. But in the end, where the film ends up, in a way, it's not about her and it's not about that relationship, although people have a lot of fascination with that relationship. Um, this is a film about family, I think, and about what your upbringing does to you, um, the consequences of it. So um, she would have been an interesting witness, but she, she's not, I think, key to the, to the film that we've made. I think, it's a com I think it's a very complicated thing what drove her to be self-destructive. I think she started off taking drugs because it was fun, and she liked to have a lot of fun. And her brothers took it, and everybody around her took it. It was, it was that period, it was the early 80s in New York, and. And uh, you know, one of the stories I left out of the film is Michael, her brother, talking about when he was a teenage boy, he first started to earn money as a drugs mule on his, on his uh, uh, bicycle, taking drugs, running them in from New Jersey into Manhattan. And he'd get like 300 bucks a time. And, you know, so they grew up in that world. Um, but I think, that, I think that what you see in the film is that here's somebody who um, can't find themselves, doesn't know who they are, and who is in pain because they can't talk about the central problem in their life, which I think came from the abuse. So I, th I hope that when you get to that part in the film, it does unlock an awful lot of stuff and it makes you understand why she stays married to Bobby Brown, it makes you understand what she's running away from, why her relationship with her mother is so difficult. All sorts of things, I hope, sort of click into place in a way. So I don't think it's the... It in itself is the answer to everything, but I think it, it, it's looking at almost every aspect of her life through that prism makes you understand it better. And I think also, I think most importantly, it makes you uh, uh, empathize with her 
I think that there's something, certainly that was my response when I first was approached about Whitney. I thought, oh, she seems so kind of to have destroyed herself. Why do I feel any, any interest in her, any sympathy for her? But by the end of this journey, I felt enormous sympathy for her. I felt that she really um, was a victim. And so that changes the way you think about it. It changes the way you think about what happened to her daughter. It changes everything.